Hello everyone, welcome to today's Better Moments webinar. Sorry for the, for the delay, we had a few technical issues. Uh, my name is Laura Graff and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager at Better Moments. Tonight we are sending live from Copenhagen and Paris, but as always, we would of course like to know where you are from. So you're welcome to use the chat tool to share your name and location and to say hi to everyone else attending. Tonight's lecture will be presented by Hamid Zada, who is not only a photographer, but also an award-winning filmmaker, a Harvard scholar and explorer. Hamid will share some of his magnificent images from the remotest areas of Mongolia with us, and he will tell us about his encounters with the local cultures. For this webinar, we would like to encourage you to ask questions via the mentioned chat tool. You'll find it in the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, if it's not there, otherwise you can also access it via the main menu at the top. Because after the webinar, we will have a little Q&A session where Hamid will answer your questions. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Better Moments expert sì. Hamid Sada. Sì, ho dato ancora tre minuti in modo che sia più... Buongiorno. <laughs> Does everybody hear me and see me? Uh, everybody can hear me? I, I suppose. Yes, 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 yes. yes. yes I can hear good. Okay, good. okay, well, what to say um, ab about um, uh, my work, especially in this time of confinement around the world? It seems almost in bad taste to be going off giving a slideshow of faraway places and. Uh, exotic tribal people while uh, we're all sitting home and dealing with this uh, pandemic. Uh, one thing I noticed today, in, I, I'm in France in confinement, we're allowed one hour to go outside to walk or jog and I noticed everybody was wearing masks. And then it suddenly hit me that how much I missed um, people's expressions, their smiles, their, their, their noses, the, uh, their expressions, and how much we are a mirror of other expressions and faces, how we find ourselves in others. So let me just begin with a series of uh, portraits which I actually took uh, with, why is this, with, with my iPhone. Uh, la last summer while I was visiting Mongolia. This is the hero of one of my uh, recent films, Schuchert, the, the Darhat Cavalier. So, just leave you with the intensity of uh, these, these eyes and these expressions where you can actually see me reflected in some of their eyeballs. So it is, you know, the, the, the main key here in photography, of course, there's technique and equipment, and we can talk about that a lot, but what it really boils down to is, um, is this uh, encounter. Uh, you, you are letting them see you as much as they're seeing you, and here's my mother-in-law. I'm just kidding. No, she's... <laughs> um, so even with a, with a tool like an iPhone, or with a $30,000 uh, setup like I have otherwise with a hustle blood and lights and everything, you, know, you, you practically come, boils down to the force and power of the expression and, and, and what you're reflecting off one another. Uh, I did not mean to uh, be a photographer. It was an accident or, or a filmmaker. I was studying law uh, in, in, in college and I took a sabbatical year semester abroad. I went to Nepal and Tibet and I, to these iconic landscapes I was drawn to. Uh, it was a call and uh, I could never return from these places the same way. I, I, I met people, I encountered traditions which changed me forever and left me with a taste of what I would call something authentic, something that was lacking back in life in grad school in Cambridge. I traveled widely, mostly in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, um, taking uh, portraits of tribal people, 
researching their traditions, making films. Uh, but really my, one of my favorite places, Hidden Valleys, of course, is Mongolia um, and its nomadic populations. Hence the uh, title of this uh, talk, which is Beyond the Great Wind, which I'm borrowing from um, um, the ancient Greek poets who basically uh, uh, considered, they, 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 they called this wind, which originated from the Altai Mountains in Asia and blew all across the Central Asia and reached Europe, they called it the Boreal. And they called the people who live beyond this wind, beyond this great wind, the Hyperboreans, literally the people beyond the boreal winds. Uh, so if you look at this map here, we see on the uh, left, these are the Altai Mountains. So this is probably where this great wind uh, originated. Uh, uh, and the people who live beyond it are basically uh, were the ancestors of the modern day tribes which live in Mongolia. So um, it was considered to be a hidden land uh, where the sun never sets, where people are free from disease and, and, and uh, illness. Uh, so it was a typical kind of a paradise on earth according to the late Greek uh, uh, poets of antiquity. So today what we find there are uh, tribes like the reindeer people who I uh, traveled with considerably. Uh, they live in small communities uh, in, in northern Mongolia and Tuva. Uh, and they move around each family with about um, between 100 and 500 uh, reindeer. Now, the difference between this reindeer culture and the others we see, for example, in Finland and in other places in, in Siberia, uh, is that they don't raise reindeer to kill and eat for meat. It's, they're not like cattle. They're considered uh, sacred animals. There's not that many of them. Each family, again, has between uh, 50 or, or at the most uh, 300, 500 and they are used to transport uh, on their backs uh, the family's belongings as they migrate to different locations. They're also used to uh, go hunting in, in the forests, in the mountains, other species of animals. You know, and, and this in, involvement with, with these iconic landscapes and people for me is always connected with a search for an ancient kind of wisdom. Uh, perhaps the same which the ancient Greek po poets were referring to and, 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 and looking for. And so, you know, when we go, this archaeological research shows these deer stones, for example, where you see these, uh, these, these date to about the late Bronze Age, so we're talking anywhere between uh, 10th century BC to about uh, 5th century BC. We find these uh, enigmatic uh, deer stones uh, all across this region, which shows these stylized deer kind of moving up into, in, into the heavens towards the orb of the sun. So many people think that deer had a spiritual significance as a spirit animal which escorted the, um, the souls of the deceased into the afterworld. It was a spirit animal. And we find the same idea echoed in, in contemporary shamanic ritual, where the, where the shaman transforms uh, his or her drum uh, in trance into a deer and flies off in ecstasy into the dark heavens, uh, the, 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 the parallel world of, 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 of spirits and ancestors to seek counsel from them. Uh, when a shaman uh, passes away, when dies, uh, he, uh, he or she goes under two burials, a actual burial where the body is taken up and laid on the mountain to be devoured by heavenly animals like the wolf or the great birds, uh, eagles and vultures. And then the paraphernalia, the drum, the, the robes, etc., are then buried at separately in a tree shrine along the migratory path of the tribe. 
in the taiga. So um, here is this young boy and his father who are here to pay homage to their uh, great grandmother, who was a great shaman, who who passed away uh, about seventy years ago, but is is still buried in this uh, tree shrine where they come. These tree shrines called asars act as kind of spiritual antennas, and they kind of keep uh, like a magnet. Uh, they keep the the soul of the deceased shaman near the earth's orbit, near their family, uh, so they can be contacted through rituals by living shamans to counsel and guide the 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 tribe here's a, another shaman uh, uh, coming out of trance at the end this is one of my favorite pictures where you see this is also at the end of a trance where the shaman came out of the teepee but suddenly was was uh, 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 he, he thought he was done, but suddenly there was this another surge of spiritual possession and he started dancing again. And I love the, the expression of the reindeer with that gleam in its eye, looking straight onto the shaman as he's uh, dancing in trance. This is a small uh, embroidery, which shows, uh, which is a higher loom passed down by grandmother to son and the granddaughter you see here, which uh, the star shows the uh, location on their, on their territory of these tree shrines where the, the shamans are buried. And um, so it, it, it's, it's part of a landscape memory. Uh, more than a spirit animal, uh, uh, which conveys souls to the afterworld and uh, which shamans imagine uh, carry them into the dark heavens. Uh, the, the reindeer has a practical function as a totem. Uh, most, uh, actually all, every, every child after their first bout encounter with illness is assigned to a particular reindeer which protects, protects them for the duration of their life. Uh, when the reindeer, when the totem reindeer gets old, they slaughter it and eat it as a, as a, in, in a ritual, much like the Eucharist, where we partake in the flesh of Christ. So this is the only time, actually, where the, 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 the reindeer people living in Mongolia actually eat their reindeer. So there's this very intimate and very fragile um, relationship between people and deer in this part of the world and uh, I wanted to investigate uh, further this 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 uh, sacred bond which which ties uh, people to, to animals reindeer unlike cows and sheep need to migrate uh, um, uh, quite frequently because they eat up all the, all the moss and the lichen uh, and mushrooms in the valley quite quickly. So unlike other Mongol nomads, which usually move four times a year in every, every season, uh, the reindeer people really need to move every two weeks. Uh, and while they are moving, uh, they also hunt. They, they're basically a tribe of hunters and fishermen. Uh, because as, as I said, they don't raise their reindeer as food. They use them as methods of transport. So fall, of course, is the beginning of the hunting season. So there's a hunter there with his, uh, his riding deer and another reindeer in the back to basically be able to tie and carry back anything he hunts. They mainly hunt for furs. Uh, different kinds of furs which they use themselves but also sell on the market. But unfortunately this lifestyle is also coming to an end because the government through the Ministry of Environment has decided that hunting is not such a good thing. So they've forbidden the reindeer people to go hunting and uh, much like the model in the United States where we settled the uh, Indians onto reservations, they're being paid a monthly stipend to stay put and not move 
Uh, and what usually happens is this money, as you know, goes into cigarettes and, and alcohol, and it's a sure way of uh, destroying a culture. Uh, the reindeer also um, useful in the sense that the the the, the their antlers are, are are in demand by by the Chinese traditional medicine market. So every fall they 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 fall off, or even before they fall off, the reindeer people saw them off and sell them by the kilo uh, to to Chinese middlemen. This causes a bit of um, stress to the animals because the, these antlers are not allowed to fall off naturally. They're cut off while they're still full of blood. So it does weaken animal, weaken the animal uh, and, and put stress on its immune system, but um, um, it's, um, people need the money. So there's always uh, these, 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 these concerns. It's, 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 it's not all uh, a rosy picture of a, uh, uh, of a tribal people living in harmony with their with their in their environments and and animals there's always these concerns which we all share about livelihood our children uh, how, how how to make it make it past the next month the reindeer are usually let to graze during the day in the mountains and brought back in the evenings and tied to stakes to uh, to protect them from predators like wolves Unlike uh, sheep, horses, and uh, cows, for example, the reindeer are not domesticated. They're what we call tamed. So uh, once they get away, uh, if they, during a migration or, or once they're out feeding in the mountains, if one gets away, you have to capture it quickly because if, if weeks go by, then their wild instincts immediately come back and it's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to catch them. And here, uh, this boy is uh, basically uh, went after to retrieve this young bull. Uh, he disguised himself as a reindeer and and walked in between. You don't see it in this picture, but he approached the red bull of the, the wild bull between two other female reindeer in heat to attract the bull and lassoed it. Um, the reindeer people also fish for this uh, legendary uh, uh, river monster called the taimen. It's an ancient form of a trout, which or a salmonid family, uh, reaches the uh, the length of a meter and a half. Although specimens up to two meters have also been caught, uh, and uh, usually what would how they catch it is. Uh, they, they put a, a, a mouse or a bird on a hook uh, and, and the monsters come up to uh, eat them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different form. It's, it's, it's a different idea of fly fishing, I suppose. These are smaller trout, which the reindeer people eat in their winter encampments. They break the ice and lay these nets where they fish with the hook on these lakes. This is a seasonal winter migration. Again, we see the reindeer being used to carry the tribe's belongings and, and, and negotiating this uh, landscape we call the taiga. Uh, this is a sable hunt. The sable traditionally was a major source of income for the reindeer people. And here we have a, uh, a wood press being used in the camp to soften this uh, bear skin. The reindeer people, unlike the Mongols, do not live in yurts or what we call gares. They live in tipis or what they call orts in the local language because in the taiga, the landscape is a bit more marshy and uneven. And whereas on the, on the grasslands, the, the, because the grasslands are more flat, you can build yurts on them. Here's another uh, a moment from a hunting expedition moving across a frozen lake. 
And, and here you really appreciate the, uh, the importance of the, of the reindeer for the survival of these people. Uh, so, so the taiga is really the frontier between the, the steppe, the horse steppe, the horse nomads, and, uh, the, and, and the territory of the deer. Uh, uh, the reindeer can, can negotiate terrain and landscape, which is impossible for a horse. They would either sink uh, to, and break their feet, uh, in deep snow or in or in or in marsh and bogs, whereas reindeer, because of their wet, webbed feet and their dew claws, somehow manage to float over this terrain. And they also manage to survive in altitudes and uh, temperatures, which would probably kill a horse. <coughs> and here you see the hunters. They also cut off the antlers of the deer to be, to be able to move more rapidly through forests in search of game, so the antlers don't get in the way and get blocked by branches and trees. Here is a hunter and his son, and they've just, uh, hunt, they've just killed a, a musk deer, which you see packed on the back of this uh, uh, reindeer in the front. This was one of the expeditions where uh, we got lost. So yes, even the reindeer people get lost. It was a total whiteout. We reached the top of the pass and there was no way down. The reindeer knew, knew that somehow and they just like stopped and sat down. Wow, the rest of us kind of went around trying to look for, um, for a way down. Uh, of course, for me, it was it was a wonderful moment because uh, as a photographer, you're always looking for these unusual moments in, in, in difficult conditions. So I was like going wild, uh, taking photographs, uh, telling people to wait and while people were just yelling, move, move, you know, there's an avalanche coming. But it was it was, it was one of those moments where where uh, you, you, you get shots, which you would otherwise not be able to. So finally, we reached the, the forest line and made camp. Um, the reindeer people also are great skiers. Uh, there's there's uh, petroglyphs in this area which show that uh, <coughs> people use skis all the way in, in, in prehistory, during the uh, uh, end of the Bronze Age, perhaps, or even earlier. Um, and, they, and they still do use that technique. They use um, uh, birch trees and they cover the bottom of the of the skis with a horse hide. So one, 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 one side gives them traction as they climb and the other side helps them slide down, much in the same way we used to make skis in Europe. But here they, they in, in this part, they also use skis to go hunting. When they see large animals like moose or deer uh, in a valley in deep snow. They, uh, they, they race down on their skis and lasso it or stab it with these big spears or, or daggers. Uh, that's not a wolf, by the way, it's a dog. They, they have these very wolf-like looking dogs, the reindeer people, which uh, they're very wolfish, uh, uh, and they're quite fierce. Uh, they, they, they're famous all over Mongolia, and people come specifically to the taiga to buy a, these hunting dogs from the reindeer people. So here, in, 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 on that day, uh, we were looking for some runaway reindeer, so the, it was impossible to catch them because every time we try to approach them with reindeer, they just run away. So the, the guys uh, tried to um, corner them into this bowl and ski down really fast and lasso them. <laughs> I could not believe it before I saw it. So I, they just told me to wait and look. So that's what I did and I got these great, amazing shots. Uh, but it failed anyway. They didn't manage to catch the reindeer, and the guy in the front actually broke one of his ribs. Anyway, so this, um, uh, you know, not, 
not only is 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 the lifestyle and culture of these uh, of the rain uh, of, of the reindeer people um, uh, uh, under pressure because of external pressures, but also internal pressures. There's only 40 families, 400 people, and the, and the, the and and because of the problem of inbreeding, uh, they have now. Um, uh, marrying into uh, Mongol populations who live on the steppe below. So this is a Mongol family which has come up to ask for the hand of a bride to take back down to the steppe. Uh, so that means their children uh, will start speaking a different language. The Mongol people are a Turkic speaking race, whereas the Mongols speak Mongol. And uh, uh so here what is interesting in this ritual uh you're supposed to make the um the grooms uh, and boys wait as long as you you uh you can to to valorize uh, the bride so these these this is ritual kind of game of waiting uh so this poor couple have come have been sent by the groom to ask for the bride and uh the, the parents of the bride just make them wait until they start sweating. Uh, so finally, after a couple of hours, they come and sit down and have tea and discuss things. Here is the, the, the bride wearing a beautiful uh, fur hat, preparing for the ceremony. This is the parents of the bride, see in green. There is always a um, uh, choice to be made today for these people between the health of their reindeer that need to move very frequently and the future and education and health of their of their children who need to be in schools. Um, uh, so there's more and more of a um, of a movement out, out of the taiga down to to the step to the Mongol step. Um, uh, where they marry into Mongol families uh, 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 down in, in, in the valley. Uh, but even for Mongol nomads, things are changing. There's this um, uh, frontier between humans and the wild uh, with its rules, with its taboos, which have maintained this culture for thousands of years. But now all of that is being put into question by forces of modernity and the need to make money when the when especially when a cash economy overtakes the traditional uh, economy where um where animals are no longer seen as as food or or transport but uh, as as a cash crop you have hunters coming in from outside which decimates uh populations of of bear, of deer, of fish, uh, almost overnight, load everything in trucks and leave to sell. So this is putting an, an immense pressure on, uh, on, on these nomad families who do hunt, but they traditionally used to hunt just to feed themselves and supplement their meat rations. <coughs> uh, this means the wolves are also out of, out of uh, prey, so they start attacking uh, the herds more often. So this creates a conflict between the two alpha predators of the, of the steppe, man and wolf. Uh, Mongol nomads here we see are in yurts, not in teepees as we saw before with the reindeer people. And you see the ground is much more dry and uh, flat. So uh, this kind of structure is more um, efficient. They move about four times a year. Uh, this particular family uh, came across a small fawn in the hay, a mother was probably killed by a wolf or a hunter, so they adopted it much like, much like they would adopt one of their own. They bring it into the family. And once they kill the wolf, what happens? They sort of adopt the wolf pups and the temptation then to raise them and sell them to the Chinese middleman becomes great. So that everything is slowly falling out of balance because of the need for, for, for more, for greed. Here is a marmot hunter. Basically, um, one positive aspect of the socialist system was it really controlled hunting. Since the transition to a uh, market economy, um, 
everything has just gone mad. So the population of all the large mammals have fallen. Marmots have completely been almost wiped out. So this is one of the local black markets where you find everything traded from from uh, from animal parts to wolf pups to marmots to uh, to uh, Whitney Houston and Britney Spears DVDs uh, whatever you want yeah portraits of the jolly mama but behind those smiles is a rude and tough life. For example, in the winter uh, encampments, there's, there's no water. So daily people have to go out, chop out uh, large chunks of ice and transport them back, for example, uh, to make tea and, and, and food. So it's very understandable why people, why we might romanticize this life, but people themselves, uh, really want a way out. So there's this, uh, this, this desertion from, from the nomad step out into the towns and cities. It's not an easy life. This is during one of the winter migrations where usually a part of the family moves with the herds and another usually uh, packs up the yurt and the belongings which used to be uh, transported on the back of camels and big yaks. Now people use these uh, old Soviet trucks. But as you see in a, in a cold morning when it's minus 30 outside, uh, everything's frozen. So they light this huge fire underneath the car to loosen up the axle grease and the oil uh, to be able to actually uh, uh, jump start the car. There's a hand, he's using a hand crank there to start it. And the migration begins. They usually in the winter, they move longer than they do in the, in, in the spring and summer. Uh, it's over a couple of days, maybe about 150, 200 kilometers. Whereas in the summers, uh, it's much less, maybe about 20 to 30 kilometers. Along the way, many animals succumb to the to, to winter storms and traditionally, uh, uh, the nomads will leave their heads on these mountain shrines called the ovos as offerings to the uh, mountain spirits. And you see, if you notice, many of these um, skulls have a big hole in the forehead. So these are compassion killings, meaning that the nomad will take a look at an animal which is just too sick and weak to move. And instead of leaving it uh, behind for the wolves, he kills it himself with a uh, blow of a hammer to the forehead. Uh, spring is also a very difficult season. In most parts of the world, it has uh, connotations of, of warmth and flowers blossoming uh, and joy. But in Mongolia, it's one of the most deadliest seasons where the steppe becomes an amphitheater of death uh, with vultures and wolves uh, uh, tracking herds as they move, as the sheep and goats who have not had fresh grass for over um, uh, uh, six months now are basically giving birth so they're becoming very weak and they literally drop their ewes and calves on the on the step and the children have to go run and collect them uh, because the mothers will sometimes give birth but then their instinct is confused and they, they will follow the herd so the these calves will remain out there and sometimes die so these are all the calves uh, which were born which who, who died so they skin them but they also managed to recycle that uh, tragedy into, into, into the economy. Uh, the skins of these lambs are much softer than sheep, so they're much in demand for the tunics, uh, for the dells, the, the robes, the inner lining of uh, uh, robes worn by women. Uh, of course, during this season, one has to remain awake. So nomads hold 24 hour vigils with some people taking turns sleeping while others go out with flashlights even in the middle of the night to bring back uh, the calves which were being born. And culture has somehow accommodated for this need. Uh, there are songs you play during the season. You see this man playing the horse head fiddle and the, 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 uh, to, to, to keep awake and warm uh, and, and to go out uh, to bring back these lambs 
as they're born on the step. Here is a uh, boy learning how to make a fiddle with one of his uncles. So nomad culture is quite rich and self-contained. And uh, once you wonder what's going to happen once a nomad leaves and settles in a, uh, a town in a uh, small concrete apartment to work as a driver or a welder, what does that do to his children? Uh, what, what, what does that do to their sense of nature and how they relate to animals and, and to themselves? What happens to all these little bits of culture which are integrated in, a, uh, uh, in, in, in their li life, in their lifestyle, uh, and what happens once they are separated from, from this environment? How do they, these things survive? Will they just become part of a museum and part of a, a music academy for uh, university students to study? Uh, probably so, and it is. But uh, what's interesting is to actually see it and observe how it's used in, uh, in its authentic cultural and environmental uh, environment, which uh, we are losing. Here's a group of men who are heading out to look for gold. Uh, in recent years, uh, the need for money and cash has uh, sent many nomads off to dig their rivers for gold. These are artisanal miners called, called ninjas. Uh, 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 they're called ninjas from, because they resemble the ninja turtles, because they have these big green tubs on their backs. Uh, so people started calling them the ninja miners. And here they are uh, up in the Mongol taiga. You see one guy is using a floor mat of a car to actually try to separate uh, mud from nuggets. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible. So, you know, these once pristine valleys are being overturned again, not only by big companies uh, which come in and, and, and destroy everything, but also from the, the, the nomads themselves who just need a bit more. For a few pepitos of gold, uh, you know, uh, you, you can start, you know, buying more things like television sets and videos and, and, and a motorcycle instead of riding a horse, which is problematic because you have to feed it. I remember 10 years ago, everybody was on a horse. Nowadays, when you got in the country, almost everyone's on a motorcycle. But what, they, they, they still like these, uh, if you look on the gas tank of the motorcycle, it's the horse motorcycle. So the horse becomes, the, the, the motorcycle becomes uh, the, 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 the new incarnation of, of the horse. Um, so these once pristine valleys where you went to collect uh, berries are now being overturned uh, into this apocalyptic kind of landscape. So it's understandable, people, times are changing and people are trying to move. They're moving, moving away from the steppe uh, and there's nothing one can do or one should do really. I mean, it's really their choice. One, one can't really argue with these people to stay uh, away from the cities and, and the imagined comforts. So many people, this is a shot of Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, where many, many nomads end up thinking they will attain a higher degree of comfort and luxury, but in fact, it's the opposite. They end up in in slums on the on the outskirts of the of the city with no running water or sewage, uh, a lot of crime, and uh, they, uh, for the most part, become miserable. Is this what Chinggis Khan wanted for his people when he warned them not to settle down? When what one wonders these days. This is a old socialist uh, fresco, uh, a little mosaic uh, of the ideal um, uh, society, progress, science, uh, all that. Uh, and then underneath, you see the reality, this, this kind of bleak, this couple over, looking over this bleak kind of land, urban landscape, this netherworld of... of, of of, of progress. So the old and the new are always 
side by side, even when there is always rupture, but but also con continuity. This is the challenge of, of all developing cultures and societies. Uh, here we have uh, Mongols lining up in their dells to visit uh, the, the Louis Vuitton shop, which, which opened up. This is on the, on the second day of the opening of the Louis Vuitton shop. So I'll let you judge uh, which man is more elegant, uh, his traditional attire or the, the classic. Uh, but that brings us to the, uh, the conclusion of this talk. Uh, so for me, um, again, um, uh, these nomads are not, these exotic tribes, these places are, 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 are not for us to kind of idealize and, 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 and try to help people remain there. I mean, this is their choice. We can inform them. For me, what... Uh, what the nomad steppes and these uh, tribes people represent is through them, I would like to understand what we have lost, what uh, contemporary urban uh, society, what our condition uh, has been uh, disconnected from and, and, and yearns to, uh, to reconnect with. So in my photography, I try to come up with these iconic, uh, although a lot of it is reportage, I do focus on iconic compositions. For me, these are keys which bring in all these ideas we talked about, about totem animals, the, correct, the connection with uh, bet, uh, the sacred bond between uh, humans and, and spirit animals and, and nature. And I, I, I create these compositions as almost keys which enable us to, um, to go back, uh, to, to forego the rational mind and all these concerns. But as I think an image is powerful when it becomes iconic. What is the icon? The search for the iconic is something that releases us, which, which momentarily short circuits the rational mind. And through its atavistic uh, um, uh, composition, and it's, it, it, it opens this, another dimension in our consciousness, which helps us go back to that, to that mythical place, that place which the Greek po poets called Hyperborea, uh, a, a magic place in our imagination where people still spoke the language of animals. Um, so thank you. This is, um, this is the conclusion of my talk, and I'm now willing to take any questions if you'd like. Thank you, Hamid. Um... Yeah, now it's time for our Q&A session. So um, you're welcome to use the, the chat tool, as we said, to ask any questions. Um, I saw there was one before, um, which said, what are the practicalities of communicating, living and traveling? Uh, do I write this? Do I answer you or do I write it down? Or I mean, it's better to answer. No, you, you can answer it now. Oh, good. Well, the practicalities is, um, um, it always helps to, um, uh, to, learn, to learn a bit of the language. I mean, all these countries I travel through, I, I, I make an effort for a couple of months to, to learn some minimal language and in, uh, in other places which I travel, I've, I've studied the languages academically. So that really helps break a lot of barriers. Of course, it's not possible for everyone, but even if you can, you, uh, you, you go in there with a bit of knowledge of, of the tradition itself. Uh, and uh, basically you need, um, you, I, I like to travel light, to be mobile and rely as much as possible on the uh, on the local community to on their wisdom I, to eat what they eat to travel how they travel to dress how they dress uh, and so it becomes a not only a learning opportunity but I feel just much more safe in the hands of people in, in with their methods of, of survival and travel um, so the, 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 I, 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 I devote myself, complete, I put myself completely, not completely, but almost entirely into their, into their care. Uh, so this kind of um, 
is in line with another question that we had. Uh, how do you blend in so as not to change the dynamic of the situation? Well, uh, you know, there's this whole anthropological study done about, uh, you know, the observer changing what is observed, and we cannot escape that. So there's this myth of uh, cinema verte, which claims that, you know, you can go in there and not change anything and just pose your camera and be away and use a zoom and, and just be as unobtrusive as possible. Well, you can do that if you want. I've also tried that. But I've come to the conclusion that one should fully assume one's presence. It's a dialogue. Uh, so not, not only do you not hold back and be unobtrusive, you have to become part of the family. You, you, you live with them. You, 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 if you have to, you fight with them. You make love to them. You, 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 you have adventures you, uh, uh, until you become part of them. And that's when the magic occurs. That's, that's when the inhibitions fall away. Uh, it, it might take some time, but at the end, your photography and what you gain from that culture will, will, uh, will be very different from going there as a tourist or as a traveler. And this question fits quite well. Um, how receptive are the native folks to foreigners coming to take photographs of their daily life? It depends how you come again. It's, it, it, there's no rule like these people don't like foreigners or they like foreigners with cameras. I've seen them react differently to photographers. Some they, 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 they throw stones at, others they embrace and take in as their family and, uh, and travel with and open up to. It's all, again, what, what, what I was trying to get across in the beginning was uh, we, we mirror each other. So it's very important. It's not only as an ethnographer, as a, as a photographer to see the other. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's also about letting them see you to expose your own vulnerabilities, uh, your own humor, your own stories, your own questions, uh, your own fragility. Once you expose that to them and you show yourself, you become human for them. And that, that's, when, that, that's, that's when the magic occurs and the bond happens. Uh, so uh, that's the answer to that. <laughs> Um, was there, what was, what was your most memorable encounter you had in Mongolia? Memorable encounter? Well, many, I mean, uh, many, many, but, uh, I mean, I, it's, it's like saying, what's your favorite food or what's your favorite music? Um, I, I, you can't really answer that, honestly, because there's so many musics and moods and different and, and foods and you can't have chocolate cake the whole time you want a pizza one day or something but but there are moments which do stick out many um to go back to the slideshow was uh, that time we got lost on the pass with this hunting party where even the reindeer people themselves got lost in a complete white out in the blizzard it was getting dark we we're on the high pass there was no visibility the reindeer themselves stopped moving and they just sat in the snow the snow was climbing up and what was great was i just turned to one of the reindeer people and said well, what, what, what are we going to do now he just turned around and started laughing and singing you know, just, isn't the taiga great and you know it's, it's 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 that bravado in the face of you know, total danger, and we, we, this one thing that remains with me is is, is that the, the the wonderful heroic nature of these people, of these ordinary people in their daily lives, which which uplift me and give me courage when I come back here to to our world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, that, that moments like that, I would say. How often do you go to Mongolia? I try to go every year, but as you know. Um, uh with all this that's happening right now in our lives uh it, it's totally put into question our uh, our future ability to travel uh, how are we going to be able to travel uh, you know, the whole idea of vaccinations this idea of uh, xenophobia coming into many nations closing their borders uh, before it was about race and migration now it's going to be about health and viruses so there's always, you know, human beings are caught between uh, two aspects of themselves. The, you know, the reptilian mind with its fear and desire and the, and the higher mind or the neocortex with its altruism and compassion. Uh, so uh, we'll see how that plays out. But um, 
on a, you know, we're, we're, we're at a fork, we're, we're at a crossroads. In, yeah. in Hopefully society. again next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a few questions regarding equipment. Uh, one of them is what equipment do you carry with you? Well, I have a whole arsenal of cameras, you know, uh, starting from an iPhone to a Hasselblad, uh, Canon uh, uh, digital in between, which I use also for uh, video videography. Uh, so it really depends, you know, so you have all, all this equipment out there. And, uh, but what's really important uh, was the use of uh, light, mm -hmm. ashes. I would encourage everyone to, uh, to, to experiment with um, off-camera flashes, meaning with a cord on a hot shoe where you hold a flash with a kind of a, a softener and you try to... And this, this was the old trick they used to teach us at National Geographic before Photoshop came out. Uh, so basically what you do is you expose for the sky. I'll mm -hmm. give you one big secret tonight. You expose for the sky and you fill in your subject. So this way you get this kind of HDR effect without Photoshop. Uh, this, this, this was the old trick we always went out with in the old days. Uh, and, I, and I think it still produces much better results, much more magical results when you, and, and the flash is meant to be used during the day, not at night. Most people think you take a flash in a dark room and flash it with this horrible white light, which illuminates everything to death, but it's not. This flash is supposed to be put uh, put down and then just blink to bring out expressions in people's faces and hands and and to give that little bounce of light in animals eyes uh, when I was traveling with George Schaller this great naturalist he told me that I mean you know a, a successful picture of, of animals was a natural, is when you get the eye and when you get that that little gleam in the eye so uh, and it's the same for humans you know so the, you know I think light and working with off-camera flashes is, is quite important, and I would encourage ev everybody to do that. Yeah. Um, and of course, we'll talk more, more about that practically during the workshop in the field next year if we, uh, if we go. Yeah, and we already touched up on that in the, in the last webinar with Arne, which was about traveling with flash. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in regard to that, like, how do you how do you carry all this equipment around when you go to such remote places? Uh, with help. Uh, I usually have a, a small backpack with a, the, cam with the camera I'll be using at that time. I make a decision, either take the, the medium format or the Canon or whatever, uh, and, and two lenses. And then the rest is in uh, Pelican cases, either in a van or on a horse. Uh, so there's a there's a horseman which accompanies me. Sometimes we're on but there's no trail, so we're on horseback. So I'm on a horse with my backpack with my camera. There's another horse uh, being pulled by another horseman, and I have a camera assistant with me, who uh, I communicate with. I say, well, Jaggy, I need uh, that lens uh, or that thing. Uh, so he's he he knows. So there's 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 all this movement mm -hmm. uh, behind, uh, but usually I try to work with one assistant. And there was one question, um, were you able to charge batteries or did you have to pack everything? In uh, the um, that also depends. In places where there's roads and we can have a base camp, uh, we usually have a generator. And so we, we always, we, we go out for our photography, then come back. So at night we turn on the generator and with an oscillator, uh, we, we manage to charge the battery so it doesn't blow them. So that's a very important thing to have when you're using generators because the current is uneven so you want something which which fixes that uh, otherwise when you're going really far away on these expeditions with the reindeer people you you i i take like 25 batteries with me you know mm -hmm. so I, I just charge them all before it's this whole bag of of batteries that's the only way you can i i've tried to deal with and use um the solar chargers they're just too unreliable for me yet Mm -hmm. It won't work as fast, and uh, especially when it's overcast and all that, it's, it's just a drag. Uh, it's just not efficient enough. And one question regarding the, the post-production. Uh, how much time do you spend editing the photographs? And do you do that <laughs> at the much. end of the trip? <laughs> too much, too much. Well, I always take a <laughs> laptop with me in Basecamp, so I'm always like looking at the stuff. But you come back and... Uh, 
And you know, you know what it is. You, 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 if you shoot in raw, you basically come out with this kind of muddy image full of detail, which you have to uh, bring out. It's, it's like having a block of marble, which you need to chip and bring out your 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 statue or your final image. And that, that's what working with raw is like. It takes time. So there's there's pictures which I've taken, you know, five years ago. I'm still not happy with. Mm. <laughs> I think I'm on. So it's it's ongoing. Yes, we all know that issue. <laughs> it's just uh, it's the hassle for everyone. Okay, I guess that was it for today. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. For uh, for sharing all your work with us and. Uh, a good confinement and uh, put it to good use. Yes, it was definitely a, a nice glimpse into this intriguing cultures in Mongolia. Okay. Um, yeah, so for, uh, for everyone who asked during, during the presentation, we already have a date for our 2021 workshop in Mongolia, which will of course be led by Hamid. Uh, it will take place from the 3rd to the 12th of June, and there are a couple of spots left, so if you're interested, you're welcome to sign up. Keep in mind that you will receive a full refund on the workshop price if we have to cancel any trips due to Corona which we hope we don't have to. <laughs> um, yeah, and as usual, a few uh, organizational things. We will, of course, send you a recording um, so that you can rework the presentation later. And of course, we will also host a few other webinars in the next couple of weeks. So please check your inbox as we will send out further details with our newsletter. And if you aren't subscribed to us yet, then you can sign up via our website. That's all for tonight. Thank you so much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. And uh, we hope to see you for our next webinar.